and make sure everybody understands that. And then on top of that, if you have any questions or or thing, and things you want answered during the presentations, it's hard to stop during the presentations, but please put your questions in the chat window and we will answer them as we get done uh, the presentation. All right, so let's get started. So accomplishments for Marlboro Hospital. In the fall of 21, we, you know, we all participate in LeapFrog. Most hospitals do participate in this. We have had uh, great news there. We've had uh, six straight years with an A. Um, you know, we have not got the 2022 score yet. That should be coming out in November. But not only did we get an A, we actually won an award for one of the top teaching hospitals in the in the country. Uh, so overall, uh, great work. This is a really a, a measurement of the safety being provided in our organization um, from all the caregivers in the hospital and the differences they make for our community. So we did a little celebration for the team around that, and uh, it was a fantastic uh, recognition. So in we also got an A in the spring. That's that's a smaller uh, score, but we'll see what the fall one comes because that's the annual review uh, that gets published uh, nationally. So we'll we'll shortly get that. Some of the shout outs that we have in the environment. Um, not only were we recognized by Leapfrog, uh, we were also recognized by uh, Money, which is used to be Money Magazine and Leapfrog. Uh, we were one of the top 148 hospitals in the country. I'm not sure how big 149 was for a number, but uh, it's kind of weird to be one top 148. But altogether, that's out of 3,300 hospitals nationally. <clears throat> um, so it's a fantastic recognition of the organization and what the what the team has done here, and the care we're providing to the community. So you know, overall, great results, and uh, we like to be recognized in many ways nationally. So I'll jump over to some causes for applause. Um, it was crazy. It feels like it's been two years ago at this point that we were running the uh, COVID uh, test center. Uh, we originally started it on site here at the hospital, quickly outgrew that site, worked with the city around some stuff, and then eventually worked with uh, New England Sports Center. We were able to move our site over to that uh, the sports center, and pretty much all of us were working there on random days, running cars through there, running patients through there. I believe in January we hit our high. I think one day we did almost uh, 2,500 total tests uh, in a four hour block. Um, but all in all, in the times that we did it, we've almost tested, we almost did 150,000 150, total tests uh, through our small little site that we did here, which really drove a lot of uh, community satisfaction, a lot of give back to the community. And you know a lot of partnership throughout because we, we've had a good partnership with the city, a good partnership with the sports center, and we had a lot of staff. You know, you can see some of the pictures of the staff, and and honestly, it was fun because at the end of the day, you saw your results, you knew how many patients went through, and you saw how many people got their got their tests done in a timely manner. So, it was a really a great event. You know, not necessarily unhappy that we're not doing it again. Uh, hopefully we're through the testing stage, but overall we did a great job here as an organization doing that for the community. Another thing that many people did not recognize, but you know, we definitely want to uh, recognize the state, you know, during the highlight, uh, high, high volume of COVID in January, February, and March of last year, the state implemented the, uh, called up the National Guard to help out in the current environment. And we actually ended up with four National Guardsmen here. Uh, some of them worked in our testing site. Some of them worked in the hospital, just you know, being around to help flow for the patients in the ER. Um, and we just wanted to recognize those National Guardsmen who stepped up and, and really did provide a, a huge service to our organization and to our patients and community. So we definitely want to recognize them, especially coming up closer and closer to um, uh, Veterans Day next month. So big shout out to all that they have done for us as an organization. And I think across the, the state, we had about 3000 total guardsmen called up. So it was overall a great thing. Unfortunately, we still have to talk about COVID, right? You know, COVID has not gone away. It's still in the community. Uh, the good news is it's, it has right now a little bit less of an impact in the hospital. Um, you, this is our last 14 day trend of where we are with COVID at Marlboro Hospital. We currently have four patients as of yesterday. The blue box are the inpatients, the oranges are uh, ICU level patients, and the gray are patients in our ER with COVID. 
they may or may not be admitted, so we don't count them in the number. The good news is, is our number has been very steady. Certainly, we've had a couple days where we pop up and other days where we go back down to the, our normal run rate. Um, this is not going to go away. Uh, the good news within it is, you know, the, 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 there's only about 50% of the patients actually have primary diagnosis of COVID. The others show up for other reasons and then find out they have COVID because we're still testing all patients on admission to validate whether or not they have COVID because it's how we ensure safety in our hospital to our caregivers and other patients. So we wanna make sure we're doing that. So really only about 50% of all the admissions are directly related to COVID issues. The other 50% are people who admitted for other reasons who have COVID um, and, and it it's, this increases the complexity of how we care for them. So overall, it's going pretty good. Uh, however, we're in a stage right now where we're starting to see flu in the community. Um, we're a little concerned about that impact. I think we've already seen a little bit of what that concern is like. The third piece of the tridemic that's out there today is what we call RSV, which is a, a respiratory uh, inflammation for pediatric patients. And we're seeing a large uptick in that primarily over the fact that we've been masking for a few years. Uh, and so people have not been exposed to things. Their immune systems are lower and we've seen a huge uptick to the point where a, it's a crisis situation for pediatric beds across the state, across the country actually. And we're working as a system trying to find some ability to expand our pediatric coverage out uh, into other areas right now to make sure we have enough beds to provide that. The worry is, is as we move towards flu, is will flu have a similar impact, right? You know, we've been masking uh, for two years now that you know people aren't masking and they haven't been exposed to other uh, uh, viruses, et cetera. You know, the immune systems might be lower. So we're, we're a little worried about it. Maybe it won't happen, but we need to make sure we're appropriately planning ahead for what may or may not come throughout the winter and into the spring. So. Uh, overall, it's been a pretty busy year, and I'll touch base on that shortly. Just give you some of the highlights of what's going on for our hospital. It's funny, you know, the top line here are total discharges. Really, we, we take discharges and observations as one because they're, that's the real true impact on our inpatient floors. All in all, we're basically at zero. We've had zero growth. So you would think, oh, it's not, it wasn't a bad year because it didn't, it's not busier. What's not on here are patient days. Um, we're struggling to get patients discharged and move throughout healthcare across the whole system, not just you know, Marlboro, but all healthcare entities. Um, the nursing homes, the assisted livings, the other environments all have issues with labor. So they've all closed beds and they're not taking patients back timely, uh, creating issues. So we've seen, unfortunately, an, a length of stay increase of about 0.6 days, which doesn't seem like a lot, but historically patients stayed in our hospital for about 3.5 days. And when they're up to over four days, that's about a 23% increase on length of stay, which then creates issues getting patients through our ER up to the floor. And when our patients are boarding in the ER, then we can't get as many patients through the door and into the ER. So there's lots of challenges around that. <clears throat> What we have seen is a huge growth in our emergency room visits, right? You know, so we've gone from about 25,000 a year in 21, which is kind of close to our historical, um, to 22, we did just over 28,000 total ER visits. And we're seeing this in many ways. One, there's just a lot of people coming to the ER. Um, two, there's a lot of behavioral health visits that are happening in our market. So we're seeing an increase in behavioral health visits in our ER. And three, um, there's definitely a, a supply issue and access to primary care in general across the state. And many of those people are checking to see if you have uh, any symptoms of COVID before you go. And if you do, they're not seeing the patients. They're actually asking you to go to the ER, which to, you know, creates lots of challenges for us in general. But you know, we're working on it. We're looking at some opportunities around that. But overall, um, we're seeing a lot of patients there. And on the surgery side, as you can see, our inpatient surgeries are down, which is okay because a lot of uh, procedures have moved to outpatient and we've seen an uptick in our outpatient volumes overall. So generally uh, at Marlboro Hospital, we've had a pretty good volume year in 22. Um, we're waiting to see what the expectations are in 23. So we'll see what happens in the market as we move forward. All right, so I'm gonna end with just a, a quick summary of our future state and then I'll turn it over to Doug Brown. Um, Competitive healthcare environment. Um, 
absolutely. You know, we are all in a very competitive healthcare environment. We did have in uh, which feels like a long time ago. We had the, the recent challenges with Mass General Brigham uh, planning to put up a large outpatient center in Westboro. Uh, we do want to thank all the legislators and all the community members who spoke up to, uh, against that proposal. Uh, you know, we were successful in defeating that. Um, but at the same time, we still need to figure out how we can compete in the market to make sure that we're providing all the care we can to those people who live in our communities. So we're working through some uh, alternative opportunities, which I'll touch base on in the short term at the end of this. Um, labor shortages. I don't know if anybody else has heard about this, but we might have a little bit of a challenge in the labor market right now. Uh, Marlboro Hospital um, has been a little bit isolated until recent, uh, the last two or three months. We're starting to see a, a, a bigger impact there. We were able to staff our facility, some through agency, some through recruitment, but we're starting to see a little bit of a crack in that uh, um, process in the local market. We're seeing labor shortages in nursing. We're seeing labor shortages in pretty much every uh, every job. Most of our registration people are agencies from other states. Uh, it is a challenge, and and it's certainly even paying more doesn't necessarily solve that problem. We're just seeing a lack of uh, people in that market. Uh, we'll continue to work on it. We did host an open house hiring uh, forum, uh, I believe, a week ago. Uh, and we were able to make job offers to seven, six, five or seven people from that uh, for certain jobs in our or in our in our hospital. So certainly we'll continue to focus on this, but, you know, we're we're working to, you know, create relationships with all the schools, making sure we have flow coming in. We're doing training. We're doing nurse training programs for new grads. We have a lot of things going on to make sure we have uh resources and, and connections to help our help strengthen that labor uh, supply in the future i talked about the impact of covid and the final piece i'll end on is the capital improvements to the physical plant um, uh, umass more health we have an agreement with a company called jensen partners uh, and they're working through what to do with marlboro hospital you know and, and we've got multiple options on the table um, all the way from a, a basic physical update expansion of the current facility to um, full facility renewal on campus to other options around the community. On top of that, we're actually looking at what we can do to provide some outpatient uh, expansion in the communities. We're looking at doing some medical office space. We're looking to look at some what we call OPLs. Uh, those are outpatient procedural labs uh, and, and figuring out whether or not we should do those all as one campus or in a few areas to, to help make sure people have access. So uh, there's a lot going on. We don't have a final answer to that. We will know more between uh, the December and March timeframe around that project. So we'll provide an update as we get closer. So I'm going to actually, at this point, turn it over to Doug, who's going to give a UMass Memorial Health update and then talk about the anchor mission. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Doug. Uh, let's just make sure you can move the screens. Let's see. Well, good morning, everyone. It's so great to be here and be with you again. Uh, let's see. I don't know if I can move these slides. Um, Helen, I might have to ask you to do so if you don't mind. I only have four or five. So, um, so I think everyone is uh, very familiar with our uh, healthcare system, but um, we're a system of about 15,000 caregivers. That's a little lower now because of the reasons that Steve stated. We're having huge uh, issues regarding um, uh, staffing. But uh, you know we have uh, now four uh, hospitals that we own, the Academic Medical Center, three community hospitals, including Marlboro uh, Health Alliance and Harrington, which we acquired a little over a year ago. Uh, we have a number of affiliates we work with, a large medical group, and, uh, and a large behavioral health provider, Community Health Link in, in Worcester. Um, you can go to the next slide, Ellen. So um, what I want to just give before I get into the anchor mission is a little bit of an update on um, kind of what's happening uh, for hospitals uh, uh, really uh, across the country and, and what we're feeling in central Massachusetts. 
Um, it is a really difficult and challenging time for hospitals, probably the most significant in my career. I've been at UMass Memorial for 20 years, and we're we're dealing with a, a, a number of factors. Uh, our, the staff is incredibly beleaguered, as you, as you know, they've, uh, they've worked through heroically uh, the last two and a half years of, uh, of the COVID pandemic. They've risen to the occasion. Uh, and now um, we're just having huge uh, problems in terms of recruiting and retaining staff. And it's happening at every hospital across the country. To give you just a little sense of this as a system, the amount of money we paid in 2022 for what we call premium uh, pay, which is uh, uh, travelers who are uh, nurses and other staff that we have to hire from traveling agencies because we can't, uh, we don't have the staff right now, which often costs us two or three times as much. The amount of money for overtime and premium pay amounted uh, overall to $150 million this year. That's extra money we had to spend uh, because we don't have enough staffing. The other thing I would just mention is that like some facilities, um, uh, post-acute facilities and, and other hospitals who, if they don't have staff, they can just close beds or close capacity. At UMass Memorial, we don't have that opportunity. We are the safety net. Uh, we cannot uh, close our beds uh, because they're so desperately needed. So. Uh, we just have to find the staff to, to support our uh, services. Um, I will say that um, in Massachusetts, uh, we are uh, positioned better than most. Uh, you know, Mass General Brigham uh, has more money than anyone in the bigger size. But, but other than that, certainly for safety net hospitals in this state, we are well positioned because of a lot of the strategic decisions we've made over the years. And I think that will serve us well going forward. Um, as Steve mentioned COVID from Marlboro. Um, we're seeing an uptick across central Massachusetts. Uh, in the last week, we've moved from about 114 inpatients to 125 uh, across central Massachusetts. Uh, we're monitoring that very carefully. We're all very worried about um, this winter because if we get a spike in COVID and we get a spike in the flu, and as Steve said, uh, other, other things we're watching, we could have a real capacity problem because we're already at or above capacity in many cases. So it's gonna be a real challenge. Um, let me just talk a little bit about the unique aspect of UMass Memorial in central Massachusetts. We really are not like no other system in the state for a few reasons. We're the only safety net provider in central Massachusetts, uh, as I mentioned. We also have, as you know, a unique relationship with the state in that we support the state's only public medical school. Um, both of those uh, missions uh, are really part of our DNA. We take them seriously. We're proud of them, but they they result in much higher costs than a lot of other systems have to experience. We think it's a great benefit to this community. It's a great benefit to the state, but it it comes with uh, with a significant costs. The other issue we're facing is that we are underbedded in central Massachusetts. Uh, we have about 15 percent fewer beds per 1,000 uh, individuals in Central Mass than they do in Eastern Mass, and about 20% fewer uh, in Western Mass. So it creates a gap of about 236 beds, based on our calculations, uh, compared to the others. So we've got a huge problem. Now, we're doing a number of things to try to address that, the most significant of which is we are building out uh, uh, Beaumont, which used to be a nursing facility. It's right across from our academic medical center. We bought the building and we are transitioning that into med surge beds. Um, we have our uh, determination of need hearing in about 10 days. Uh, we're hopeful that we'll get approval for that. That will add 72 beds. They will be private beds. They will have the latest and greatest technology in the rooms. Uh, so that will significantly ease some of our issues, um, but it won't solve them. Uh, so we're we're innovating in other ways. We 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 launched a hospital at home program, which has been very successful in actually identifying for the right patient, uh, bringing care to that patient's home and giving them supports. The use of a lot of technology to to do that, uh, it's resulted in um, um, really uh, very very good um, quality outcomes. Uh, a reduction in um, um, 
in uh, patients having to come back. So across the board, it's, it's really been successful. Um, we need to extend the federal waiver on that. We're working, Jim's working really hard on that, but uh, we think that's gonna be part of the future. Um, we're also working really hard to use all of our capacity uh, across the system. One of the things we've done is become much more intentional about uh, looking at all of our bed capacity. We have a twice a day daily huddles with all of the hospitals. And so that's resulted in increases in our community hospitals. Marlboro, um, their, um, uh, their, their utilization has increased by about 13% over the past year uh, of their bed space based on a lot of these efforts. Um, the, the last thing I just wanna say um, uh, is just about our cost, because cost is obviously on everyone's mind. Um, and you know we're proud of the fact that uh, despite all of our challenges, despite our missions, we remain the lowest cost of academic medical centers in the state. You know, in the last six years, uh, Chia reports this data. Uh, our our inpatient rates, four of the six were the were the lowest of all the six academic medical centers, and two of the years we were the second lowest. So, we we believe we remain an extraordinary value. We believe that we are uniquely focused on uh, the most vulnerable and the underserved in our community. Uh, and so um, we're, we're really proud of pursuing that mission. And on that, I just wanna um, uh, mention a few things about our anchor mission. Um, th this is a, really a reimagining of our mission, which took place about two years ago by our board. And it was really motivated by this sobering recognition when we looked out in the Worcester community, we discovered that uh, two neighborhoods that are separated by two miles of distance uh, have life expectancy gaps of 11 years. So same city, same state, same nation, uh, and depending on where you happen to live, you can be expected to live either 72 years or 83 years. Um, and we just find that um, kind of, um, unacceptable, right, in our society. Now, Marlboro has gaps that aren't quite the same, but they're about six years. If you went to the wealthiest part of Marlboro to the most vulnerable, uh, we have a lot of data we're looking at, and there's a six-year gap, right? So um, so as a result of that, um, the, the reasons for that all have to do with the social determinants of health, uh, which are uh, things that happen outside our walls, right? So. The great care we provide accounts for about 20% of an individual's health, uh, but these social determinants, poverty level, height, you know, education level, physical environment, food, access to healthy food, they contribute three times as much to one's health. And so our decision was we can't be uh, authentic to our mission to improve the health of our communities without getting our outside our walls and doing something about that as well. So uh, next slide, Ellen, we, we, um, we developed this initiative, which is part of a national effort. Um, and, uh, and it really focuses on four areas, one of which I'm gonna talk about today, but we, uh, we can become very intentional in our hiring practices about looking to those most vulnerable areas to hire from. Uh, we've been successful in that. We amending our purchasing practices to to uh, triple our purchases in minority and women-owned businesses over the next five years. We've got a lot of efforts going on in that regard. We're also getting our employees out to the community to help out as well. But the investment piece is what I wanted to talk about. Um, and, and what we decided to do here was to take 1% of our investment portfolio. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Ellen. And instead of investing in stocks and bonds, like we typically do, uh, we are redirecting those investments to the community. Now, these aren't grants. We're not giving away the money. They're still investments, but they're investments that are especially designed to help promote um, uh, equity and development in ways that address these social determinants. So um, typically what we've done is we've looked for projects that need a little bit of seed funding. Often it's pre-development funding while organizations are lining up their long-term financing. We like to leverage other uh, funding. We like to work with organizations that we know and trust and are committed to making a difference in the community. Most of our projects have been in housing, uh, but typically what we'll do is we'll loan out the money for low interest, one or 2%, much lower than they get at a bank, 
they line up, they get the project going, they line up their other financing, and then they pay us back for a low rate. Um, the next slide shows uh, we've made 10 investments so far, which amount to over $4 million. Um, we haven't been able to find one in Marlboro. We found one in just about all of our other service areas, a number in Worcester, uh, but we're really eagerly looking to, to do something in Marlboro. So would love you to just think about it because I know you're so connected with the community in so many ways. Uh, just to give you a sense, the Creative Hub is a, uh, an old boys club in Worcester that's going to be rehabbed uh, and it's going to be used as a community center and art space and it's really going to help redevelop the neighborhood. We're giving them a $500,000 loan. Uh, Fitchburg uh, is doing major projects north of Main Street. We are, uh, we're doing some pre-development financing for mixed income apartments that will give preferential treatment to, to, to immigrants with artistic ability. Uh, and they'll have a lot of programs with the art museum across the street. We're doing a single family, first time homeowner uh, help. We're investing in a tiny home village, which is a really innovative concept for uh, homeless individuals to give them some autonomy. Uh, it's a village that's developed in uh, Worcester, Habitat for Humanity, uh, uh, women's health and issues in the YWCA uh, we're investing in. Uh, we're investing in Southbridge in a social business creation loan for an ice cream shop that will open. It will be the only one in Southbridge and it will employ people living with disabilities, uh, uh, cognitive disabilities. So we're eager to help that out as well. And uh, we've even got a, a, a Renaissance Medical Group is the first investment in a, in a for-profit entity. They serve mostly a Puerto Rican community in Southbridge and adult daycare. daycare. It's an amazing uh, facility that provides a whole scope and range of services to this community. And they have a huge waiting list and they want to expand and we're going to help them do that. So these are the types of investments that we're making. Uh, whenever we get return payments on our loans, we want to just invest them back in other projects. So. Um, Anyway, um, uh, we'd love to engage uh, any of you in, in thoughts, ideas, or helping you make connections with us to any similar type of projects that you know of in the Marlboro area, uh, or Hudson for that matter, but, uh, but um, you know, particularly in low income areas where we can uh, hopefully make a difference. So with that, I will turn it back to Ellen for Jim and um, look forward to answering any questions uh, toward the end of the meeting. Great. Thank you, Doug. And Ellen, I'll see if I can control this. I'm not sure. I don't seem to be able to. So if you don't mind forwarding. Um, so first of all, before I talk about legislative priorities, I, I, I don't want to miss this opportunity to say thank you literally to every person on, on, on this call, whether you're a legislator, you know, a, a city councilor, the mayor, a, a community supporter. Um, when we faced that challenge and that threat, from Mass General Brigham, you guys all stepped up and, and we deeply, deeply appreciate it. And it was very impactful. Um, frankly, the outcome was, you know, we, 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 we were thrilled with the outcome. We weren't certain that we were gonna achieve it is the way I would put it. And I, and I can recall literally right up until, I think it was either the day we found out or the day before we found out that they were withdrawing the application. The number of you who are on this call were in front of a tough audience, it, it was the the Chamber of Commerce audience, and there were you know some supporters from the Westboro area who were there, and all of you publicly stood by us. So we just want to express that thanks and that appreciation, um, and likewise to thank you for a number of the pieces of legislation and some of the budget provisions that that were advanced over the past year or two to deal with healthcare because as you all know, we were going through quite a crisis and, and, and the challenges continue, but without the support of our partners in state government and federal government, hospitals would not have been able to make it through COVID the way that we have been and, and therefore your communities would have been impacted even more. So in terms of legislative priorities before the end of this term, and I know formal sessions have concluded, there are two things that still remain a priority. Number one, as you can see here, and I'm sure you're hearing this from everybody, is the economic development bill. And um, 
as you know, that bill contains a wide variety of provisions in, impacting different industry areas, but within healthcare, there's about $350 million. I believe that was the House version to 400 million, I think in the Senate version um, that would be distributed to hospitals based upon a needs-based formula. And, and so we feel optimistic. I know that the Mass Hospital Association and Steve Walsh and his team have had a number of conversations with leadership in both chambers. We, we, we do feel um, confident that this will get through, but we just wanted to encourage you to continue to press that and, and hopefully to get that through in an informal and, and to frame the worth of this to our system for Marlboro Hospital alone, it, it's about one and a half million dollars, actually a little bit more than one and a half million dollars that we would expect to be distributed through that formula. And for the UMass Memorial System as a whole, it's about thirty five million dollars, which to Doug's point um, earlier, talking about the uniqueness of, of us as a system, if, if you step back and think of that and consider that we have a needs based formula and about 10 percent of the total distribution goes into this healthcare system. I think it really goes to show that irrespective of our overall size, our aggregate size, when it comes to safety net care and when it comes to really carrying out our mission, we really kind of, you know, I guess, punch above our weight, so to speak. The other issue, and this has actually changed since I, <laughs> since I wrote this yesterday, but one of our concerns is um, distribution of the Behavioral Health Trust Fund um, of the ARPA dollars in the Behavioral Health Trust Fund. And, and as you all know, there, there was um, disagreement between the administration, the governor, and the legislature around um, the task force or advisory council, legislative advisory council um, that would be charged with distributing this. So since I wrote this, my understanding from MHA is that, that there has actually been movement on this issue. And this is important because it, it's not simply, there was about $400 million in the trust fund, about $110 million um, was going out into loan forgiveness for frontline workers in behavioral health, both in community-based behavioral health centers, as well as in um, hospital-based centers. Given the workforce challenges that we have, that's something that's very significant. So we, we're, we're excited that that funding has been allocated and, and now we, we anxiously await the distribution. Um, next slide, please, Ellen. So in terms of our legislative priorities for next term, um, the, the first one that I'll mention, and I know it's a, it's a bit controversial, but we, we really don't think it should be, is the nurse licensure compact. Um, and so what this would do is increase the pool of potential permanent nurses that we would be able to hire. So if you think of it, if, if we are able to hire nurses from easily from New Hampshire, from Rhode Island, from Connecticut to fill the slots, it opens up the pool and helps to address this ongoing challenge where what we're doing now is relying on traveling nurses. And, and I say this with, you know, respectfully of the MA, and we, we've had a, a, a good working relationship with the MA. Their opposition to the bill, as I understand it, has essentially been that it may make hospitals become more reliant on travelers. But you've heard how much travelers cost us. And, and the latest estimate that I've heard from Dr. Dixon is approximately $20 million in additional cost per month in traveling, um, in, in traveling nurse salaries. So if we are able to hire these nurses instead, if you, you, if you get hired at Marlboro Hospital, and you're a, a New Hampshire licensed nurse who lives in New Hampshire, you go to Marlboro Hospital and become a permanent employee, you will become an MA member. And likewise at our university campus and at our, our other hospitals that have MA units. So we're hopeful for that. We, we do think it can be very important in helping to address the nurse staffing crisis and, and the costs that go along with that. The, the second issue in the new term that is a really high priority of ours is continuation of, of the telehealth um, policies that were implemented during COVID. So telehealth is one of those things where like, to the degree there's a silver lining of COVID, it's some of the types of care that, that hospitals have for a long time thought they could provide, but didn't really have the opportunity to do. And, and in the crisis of COVID, we were able to adopt a lot of these policies and they proved themselves. Telehealth is certainly one of them. Um, 
And you can see that here, the Health Policy Commission recently came out with a study on telehealth. They were concerned, and, and rightfully so, and it's understandable, in advance there was concern about whether it would drive up costs, whether it would drive up utilization beyond what, what the level of utilization ought to be. And now that they've studied it, they, they've found the opposite. And you can see the quote here, the telehealth use did not appear to increase total utilization or spending. Um, so a concern of ours, partly based upon that conclusion, is that in January, the, the rules essentially expire or change in terms of payment parity. So right now under state law, there, there's the authorization for telehealth for behavioral health, for primary care and chronic disease management. Payment parity will continue for behavioral health, but it's set to expire for chronic disease management and for primary care. And that's something that we would like to see continue. You've heard, um, as both Doug and Steve described our fiscal situation, we have a very challenging fiscal situation. And in terms of costs of telehealth, I know there's kind of an assumption that, gee, it must be lower cost because the patient can call in. The reality is you still have to have a doctor in the office. They still have to utilize all the same technologies, the same protocols, et cetera, that are costly. So your facility costs don't really reduce significantly through the use of telehealth. So we're hopeful to get um, continuation of payment parity. And the other thing, and this is important from health from a health equity perspective, is to continue the authorization for audio only telehealth where that's medically appropriate. And the reason for that is with many low income people, they may lack access to broadband, they may lack access to a computer or, or, or you know, to an appropriate device to do the, the video and audio. So audio only is something that has proved to be effective and, and we think ought to continue. Lastly, in, in terms of priorities for next term, is enactment of workforce violence legislation. It, it's, it, you know, hospitals are jam-packed. Um, there, there are more challenges, more overcrowding, more stressful situations than frontline providers have probably ever seen in their careers. And unfortunately with that is an increasing incidence of, of workplace violence, typically, you know, obviously patient on caregiver. So that's something we're hopeful to address. And again, I know the m &A will be working on that. And next slide, please, Ellen. So this is my last slide. Um, I have two, two issues on here, neither of which really falls uh, specifically within the jurisdiction of any of you, but I just wanna make sure that you're aware of it. One is Doug had mentioned the hospital at home program, which has been incredibly successful. It, it provides acute level hospital care to patients inside their home. So this is not home health care. This is actual hospital level care at home. These patients otherwise would have to be in an inpatient unit. We typically, we, we've had an incredibly successful program. We typically have about 20 patients per day who are in hospital at home. 91% of them are public payer, Medicare, Medicaid. The outcomes for the, the, the most challenged patients are the best. So the, the higher your social determinant of health challenges, the better your outcomes are. And, and there's been incredible data to show the difference in outcomes through hospital at home versus bricks and mortar hospitals, where we're finding that it's actually better for Medicaid patients. And Mass Health, therefore, is very, excuse me, very supportive of the program. Unfortunately, um, the entire federal authorization is based upon the public health emergency and a CMS authorization that corresponds with the emergency. It's due to expire when the public health emergency expires. So we are hopeful that, that Congress will enact legislation before the end of the year. None of you will be surprised that our delegation has been outstanding and very supportive. Congresswoman Trahan, um, Congressman McGovern, and both of our senators have been supportive. So stay tuned. We'll, we'll continue to fight that fight. And then the other thing, um, as you go into the next legislative term will be implementation of, of the Medicaid waiver. And, the, and consistent with that, the distribution of funding from the new hospital assessment, which essentially assesses hospitals across the state based upon their commercial volume or their commercial revenue and draws down additional Medicaid dollars, matching funds from the federal government that then is distributed 
um, based upon Medicaid volume, and also there, there will be measures on health equity and on quality. So we're, we're really looking forward to the implementation of that. We want to thank all of you for your support of the legislation and of the 1115 waiver. And one last thing that I did not include on here, but from what Steve had described about the, the difficulty discharging patients, is as the new administration comes in, a, a thing that would be very helpful is increased coordination between the various agencies, particularly within HHS, but even external to HHS, on discharge of patients, because we have many, many patients um, on a daily basis. Typically, it's about 100 patients across the system who do not need to be in an acute care setting, but we can't get them out anywhere. And, and it, it falls into a variety of different categories. Sometimes it, it's lack of insurance coverage. One of the issues that has come up quite a bit is bariatric patients. Um, and we're hopeful that, for example, in the state hospitals, such as Tewksbury, Western Mass, or Shattuck, if, if, if they purchase bariatric beds, that we might be able to get patients out into them. Other times, it, particularly around behavioral health, you have like these jurisdictional issues where a patient who may be on the autism spectrum and has behavioral health disorders, you, you, you get DMH and, and DDS kind of pointing the fingers at each other about who's in charge. This administration has tried to be very helpful, but it's something that we can, you know, it's a, it's a continuing problem and it's something that we really need a structural solution to. So to the degree you're interacting with the administration, we'd love it if you could encourage them to increase that level of coordination between the various agencies within HHS and then uh, across the secretariats as well. So I'll close it out there, but if anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer. All right, thank you, Jim uh, and Doug, obviously. Thank you for your uh, presentations. We will turn it over. I don't see any questions or thoughts coming into the chat, but I'm going to stop sharing um, the screen so we can see page, uh, faces, which is always nice. Um, and then I'm actually going to unmute the, uh, oh, uh, yep, I'm going to unmute the line so that if you don't want to put it in the chat, you can obviously ask us a question face to face, which is always nice. So just give me one second and while I figure out the unmute option here. All right, everybody is unmuted right now. So if you have any questions, feel free. Morning, Steve. It's uh, Senator Elder. <clears throat> Good morning, Jamie. How are you? Good. Good. Thanks, everyone, for the updates. A lot of information to um, take in. And um, uh, just had a few um, questions. Um, one question I had uh, is just noted that. Uh, this region or central mass has fewer beds than other parts of the state, I assume, compared to eastern mass or metropolitan Boston. And I'm just wondering, <laughs> is that just a, just because there's Sorry, I, missed the, I missed the last part of your question, Senator Eldridge. I think there was some interference. You're wondering what? Yeah, what, what you, you had stated that this region or central mass was un, under bedded. There are few, fewer beds compared to, say, metropolitan Boston. And I'm just wondering if you can explain why. Yeah, so it's, it's probably a bunch of historical reasons. Um, you, you know, uh, I think part of it is that there's a number of academic medical centers in the Boston metro west area. Uh, and... Uh, and so they've, they've got the vast majority of academic medical centers uh, there. Uh, we've got kind of a larger geography. There's, there's probably more growth that's been happening in central Massachusetts. And, you know, I think part of it is that because we're a legacy of a, of a, state, um, uh, of a state entity, we don't, we don't have a significant endowment like, like Mass General mm -hmm. Brigham's, for example. So as you know, they've been building significant bed towers, Children's Hospital, Mass General Brigham. We just don't have the ability to do that, right? And that's why, you know, we, we acquired Beaumont to increase capacity. That's going to cost us probably 125 million. If we put a bed tower on, it would be three times that amount at least, right? So <clears throat> a lot of it is just financial capacity and our inability to, to, to put these massive towers in place. But uh, that's probably more than anything. I'll, I'll invite you know, others to, to comment if they have any. And, and just to clarify, it's not an Eastern 
Massachusetts issue, which we're actually underbedded to Western Mass also. Yeah, and to national as well. Yeah. You, we're actually significantly below the national average. Okay. Thank you. Um, and, and Jim, uh, thanks so much for the update. And, and again, thanks for all your great outreach during the um, effort to, to, to stop the proposed uh, Mass General Brigham uh, Tertiary Care Center. And, you know, as, as was noted, everyone here really it was a real regional and team effort. Um, you had mentioned, I know, under the sort of legislative or budget agendas. And, and first of all, I just want to say that the legislative delegation, we were pushing hard for the economic development bill, including obviously the, the spending for, for hospitals. And I, you know, I, I do think it'll happen. It sounds like it's going to happen you know, now in November, not October. Um, but um, I, I know you mentioned the, the nurse licensure compact bill and, and certainly you know, we've of course gotten the pushback as well from the Mass Nurses Association. I guess I'm just wondering, um, and I, I had a briefing yesterday with the Neshoba Valley Medical Center uh, team because I, I represent the Air Shirley area, and and I'm just wondering on the nursing front. I understand there's shortages. Is is there an effort for our, our community colleges or like vocational schools, including Aspen Valley, to to uh, educate? More, more nurses. I mean, is that is that partly how we address this? Because because certainly M and A continues to push back on that legislation um, every session. So I'm just I'm just yeah. curious if there's a bigger it, effort. It is you, you know, it, it's an area of opportunity. So I can't cite um, the specific programs, but there there has been dialogue, and I, I recently had conversations with MHA around this issue. I, I was actually kind of shocked and i don't know if this was one off but recently spoke to to a representative from fitchburg state who said the demand for slots in their nursing program has actually decreased and and i i was shocked frankly by that i don't know if it's kind of an aftermath of people hearing how hard it is to work in healthcare, but it, it's one of those things where you know, I, I really think on a statewide level that, that we need to have a strategy to almost um, almost like a marketing strategy and, and, and to really appeal to young people about healthcare as a service profession. You know, like there's a lot of jobs out there, but this is something where you can really make a difference and, and you can really grow in the job. Um, and I think there's opportunity for collaboration with whether it be the community colleges, the state universities, the high schools. So um, I'd like to continue those conversations. So I don't have a like a, a great answer for you right now on the level of collaboration, but it really is something that we've got to do because the long-term fix is the supply. And I know that the MA will will point out the number of licensed nurses in the state, and there are a significant number. The challenge is many of them are out of the market now. And mm -hmm. I, I think of my own sister. I'm the youngest of five, and and I always like to make fun of my oldest sister, who was a nurse with UMass Memorial for like four <laughs> years and was going to continue post COVID. She just, you know, she got to a point where she said, "I just can't do this anymore," and retired this past year. And we're seeing that over and over again. So we've got to increase that supply. Yeah. So on the on the community college side, uh, Senator, we, we're working with all of them. Um, one of their biggest challenges is is finding instructors. Um, because if you don't have enough instructors, you can't create enough slots to get. Uh, so th historically, there's been a long waiting list or, or reserve list for people getting into the nursing schools. And Jim's right. The scariest part right now is enrollment across community colleges down about 26 percent this year. Um, so if if they're not getting applicants, it, it starts to make us worry about what the future is going to bring. Because um, certainly that's an opportunity. We you know it, it, I know in in the Lemister market. We get the majority of our, our nurses from Fitchburg State out of the Mount uh, in those areas, and, and we're just not getting uh, as many applicants into there. But we do a lot of their training. We've got the resources there. We bring the the, the students into the the hospitals on a regular basis to to advance them, and obviously getting them in is a pipeline for us, right? Because if they come, they like the the environment, they're going to stay. So. We're doing everything we can. We do have somebody at the system who's who's coordinating coordinating all that, but it's a, it's a tough market right now. Sure, Big, thanks so much. Um, and my last question, I don't want to take up too much time, but um, 
thank you to on the sort of local level of Marlboro. Thank you, Steve, for all you do, and, and Alan as, as well as um, Doug. I know he couldn't be here, but um, in terms of uh, Marlboro Hospital, and there's the the community benefits every year that that are provided city and I'm just wondering is is there I, I know I'm sure there is but is there a reporter and a, a detailing of, of what those services are um, to Marlboro residents or the region? I'll jump in and yes yes there there is we are required every year to re, to file a report with the attorney general and a report to the IRS as to what our community benefit and outreach is, and those are publicly available. Uh, during COVID, our bulk of our initiatives were addressed on COVID response, including testing, vaccine clinics, and we worked very hard in, and I see the mayor is on the, the line and, and city council president, Mike Gossing. The city of Marlboro really went up a, uh, beyond up beyond above and beyond helping us reach people who would not have access otherwise to both testing and to particularly with the vaccine clinic um it was great that the that the commonwealth had set up these mega sites but folks in our community couldn't get to Gillette couldn't get to Fenway Park or to the Heinz Convention Center they couldn't take time off and we were able to set one up right here um, at the Marriott Courtyard and you all several of you toured it and saw but if you went there at three in the afternoon or three thirty you saw landscapers you saw painters you saw people who English was not their primary language who were able to come in and out and be vaccinated very quickly um, and it and it, and families who were coming in and the celebration they had as part of they were able to get a vaccine which they ordinarily wouldn't. Aaron, and what's so, up? And our um so you have our sorry let me let me just mute John there. Um our uh, our efforts over the since March of 2020 were clearly directed at COVID response, which was our addressing the needs within the community. Now partnering with you know Doug and our anchor mission, we're looking at now how do we invest in the, the communities at a level that um and he gave some great examples and we'll follow up and send you some additional information from this. Um, but we really now need to have a more concerted effort of getting back out um, and do addressing others that that fall under the social determinants of health. Great. Thank, thanks so much, Alan. And, and I just want to note, and I'll put it in the chat is actually, and I don't know if there's possibilities for support, but the Metro West free medical program, which was in Sudbury, which I also represent, uh, it was mm -hmm. just a story that it just moved to Marlboro. So that's a yes, you know, yes. We're we, we're working with them. We're trying Wait. to see too about getting some of um, our staff. Uh, Louis Thomas <laughs> is on is on that group, and he sits on our patient family advisory council. So we have some meetings scheduled to see how we can integrate with that. So that was very exciting to have them come to Marlboro now. That's great. Thank you so much. We really appreciate all the answers and all the great work Marlboro Hospital does. Thank you. Great. Any other questions or thoughts from anybody today? Just, I don't have a question because actually Senator Eldridge uh, asked it, which I'm uh, appreciative of relative to um, the, the lack of access to nurses and the community college link. Um, but I did just want to echo my appreciation for all that you do and, um, and also for the communication to us. It's very helpful um, in, in keeping our pulse on what's happening. Uh, and as you know, a lot of what we hear from constituents is uh, when they are having trouble accessing um, timely care. And so having an update on what's going on in the hospital system is really helpful for us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, anytime. And, you know, Ellen, Steve is so good at doing this, but if there's any way you need information, you know, Jim is always available. I'm available. However, we can help communicate with you. Please never hesitate to reach out. You know, we have kind of our hair on fire. Well, I don't have many much hair left, but we, we all, we all are kind of like you kind of focused on our, our, our responsibilities, but we want to make sure you're in the loop on everything. So please uh, continue to reach out whenever if we're not doing enough.
Great, not, not hearing any more uh, questions. We just obviously wanted to thank you all for joining us uh, this morning and most importantly, thank you for supporting us. I think you know, you know, we are always available for us to reach out if there's an issue and, and vice versa. If there's anything that we can do to provide you more information or clarity around something that you're dealing with at the state house, please reach out. We'll, we'll be more than welcome, more than uh, happy to to give you any information we can around it. So, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, we finally got the sun out, so it's a Marlboro thing. So, thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.